The history of art focuses on objects made by humans for any number of spiritual, narrative, philosophical, symbolic, conceptual, documentary, decorative, and even functional and other purposes, but with a primary emphasis on its aesthetic visual form. Visual art can be classified in diverse ways, such as separating fine arts from applied arts, inclusively focusing on human creativity, or focusing on different media such as architecture, sculpture, painting, film, photography, and graphic arts. In recent years, technological advances have led to video art, computer art, performance art, animation, television, and video games. The history of art is often told as a chronology of masterpieces created during each civilization. It can thus be framed as a story of high culture, epitomized by the wonders of the world. On the other hand, vernacular art expressions can also be integrated into art historical narratives referred to as folk arts or craft. The more closely that an art historian engages with these latter forms of low culture, the more likely it is that they will identify their work as examining visual culture or material culture or material culture, or as contributing to fields related to art history, such as anthropology or archaeology. In the latter cases, art objects may be referred to as archaeological artifacts. Prehistoric art includes a broad range of art made by painters and sculptors from illiterate cultures, including some of the earliest human artifacts. Among the first art objects are decorative artifacts from Middle Stone Age Africa. Containers from that period have also been discovered in South Africa that may have been used to hold paints dating as far back as 100,000 years ago, a form of prehistoric art found all over the world, especially in Europe, small prehistoric statuettes known as Venus, figurines with exaggerated Breasts and bellies were made, the most famous ones being the Venus of Holyfels and the Venus of Willendorf, found in Germany and Austria. Most have small heads, wide hips, and legs that taper to a point. Arms and feet are often absent, and the head is usually small and faceless. The Venus of Hull Fields is one of the numerous objects found at the caves in Ice Age art in the Swabian Jura UNESCO, World Heritage Site, where the oldest non-stationary works of human art yet discovered were found in the form of carved animal and humanoid figurines. In addition to the oldest musical instruments unearthed so far, with the artifacts dating between 43,000 and 35,000 BCE, the best known prehistoric artworks are the large Paleolithic cave paintings that depict animals in continental Europe, particularly the ones at Lascaux in the Dordogne region of France. Several hundred decorated caves are known, spanning the Upper Paleolithic period circa 38,000-12,000 BCE. There are examples in Ukraine, Italy, and Great Britain, but most of them are in France and Spain. Many theories have been suggested about the art's purpose, the most accepted being that it was part of religious rituals, possibly to evoke hunting success. Ancient Near East stretched from Turkey and the Mediterranean seaboard in the west to Iran and the Arabian Peninsula in the Arabian Peninsula in the east. Over time, multiple civilizations appeared here, lived and disappeared here. One of the key regions was Mesopotamia, which witnessed during the 4th millennium BC. The emergence of the first cities and the earliest form of writing, ancient Mesopotamia covers present-day Iraq and parts of Syria and Turkey. Its northern half forms part of the so-called Fertile Crescent, where important Neolithic developments such as early farming and the establishment of permanent village settlements first appeared. Because the region is situated within the Tigris-Euphrates River Delta, numerous civilizations lived here, notably Sumer, Akkad, Assyria, and Babylonia. Mesopotamian architecture was characterized by the use of bricks, lintels, and cone mosaic. Notable examples are the ziggurats, large temples in the form of step pyramids. The political, economic, artistic, and architectural traditions of the Sumerians lead to the foundation of Western civilization. Multiple things appeared for the first time in Sumer. The first city-state Uruk ruled by King Gilgamesh. The first organized religion based on a hierarchical structure of God's people and rituals. The first known writing, the cuneiforms, the first irrigation system, and the first vehicles with wheels. Cylinder seals appeared here as well, engraved with little inscriptions and illustrations. Another civilization that developed here was the Akkadian Empire, 
the world's first great empire, the world's first great empire. During the early first millennium BC, after the Akkadians, an empire called Assyria came to dominate the whole of Middle East, stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. Its cities were filled with impressive buildings and art. Assyrian art is best known for its detailed stone reliefs, depicting scenes of court life, religious practice, hunting, and epic battles. These reliefs were initially painted in bright colors and placed in palaces. Besides their beauty, they also show us Assyrian life and views of the world, including Assyrian clothing and furniture. Later, the Babylonians conquered the Assyrian Empire. During the 6th century BCE, Babylon became the largest city in the world. Upon entering Babylon, visitors were greeted with the impressive Ishtar Gate, with its walls covered in vivid blue glazed bricks and reliefs showing dragons, bulls, and lions. This gate is named after Ishtar, the goddess of war and love. In the mid-6th century BC, after a series of military campaigns, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Achaemenid Empire, ruled by King Cyrus II, stretching across the Middle East and Central Asia, from Egypt to the Indus Valley. Its art incorporates elements from across the empire, celebrating its wealth and power. Persepolis, Iran, was the capital of the empire, and it is full of impressive sculptures showing religious images and people of the empire. There are also the ruins of a palace here with a big audience hall for receiving guests. Besides Mesopotamia and Iran, there were ancient civilizations who produced art and architecture in other regions as well. In Anatolia, present-day Turkey, the Hittite Empire appeared. During antiquity, South Arabia was important in the production and trade of aromatics, bringing wealth to the kingdoms that were in this region. Before circa 4000 BC, the climate of Arabia was wetter than today. In Southwest, several kingdoms appeared, like Sabah. The South Arabian human figure is usually stylized based on rectangular shapes, but with fine details. One of the first great civilizations arose in Egypt, which had elaborate and complex works of art produced by professional artists and craftspeople. Egypt's art was religious and symbolic. Given that the culture had a highly centralized power structure and hierarchy, a great deal of art was created to honor the pharaoh, including great monuments. Egyptian art and culture emphasized the religious concept of immortality. Later, Egyptian art includes Coptic and Byzantine art. The architecture is characterized by monumental structures built with large stone blocks, lintels, and solid columns. Funerary monuments included mastaba, tombs of rectangular form, pyramids which included step pyramids, saqqara or smooth-sided pyramids, Giza, and the hypogeum, underground tombs, Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Kings. Other great buildings were the temple, which tended to be monumental complexes preceded by an avenue of sphinxes and obelisks. Temples used pylons and trapezoid walls with hypothros and hypostyle halls and shrines. The temples of Karnak, Luxor, Philae, and Edfu, are good examples. Another type of temple is the rock temple in the form of a hypogeum, found in Abu Simbel and Deir el-Bahari. Painting of the Egyptian era used a juxtaposition of overlapping planes. The images were represented hierarchically. I, uh... The pharaoh is larger than the common subjects or enemies depicted at his side. Egyptians painted the outline of the head and limbs in profile, while the torso, hands, and eyes were painted from the front. Applied arts were developed in Egypt, in particular woodwork and metalwork. There are superb examples such as cedar furniture inlaid with ebony and ivory, which can be seen in the tombs at the Egyptian Museum. Other examples include the pieces found in Tutankhamun's tomb, which are of great artistic value. Discovered in 1922, long after the contemporary cultures of Mesopotamia and Egypt, the Indus Valley Civilization Akkay, the Harappan civilization circa 2400-1900 BCE, is now recognized as extraordinarily advanced, comparable in some ways with those cultures. Its sites span an area stretching from today's northeast Afghanistan through much of Pakistan and into western and northwestern India. 
Major cities of the culture include Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, located respectively in Punjab and in Sindh province in northern Pakistan, and the port city Lothal in the state of Gujarat, India. The most numerous artifacts are square and rectangular stamp seals and seal impressions, featuring animals, usually bulls, very short Harappan texts. Many stylized terracotta figurines have also been found in Harappan sites, and a few stone and bronze sculptures more naturalistic than the ceramic ones. The first metal objects produced in China were made almost 4,000 years ago during the Exia dynasty circa 1E, 1 1700 BCE. During the Chinese Bronze Age, the Shang and Zhu dynasties, court intercessions and communication with the spirit world were conducted by a shaman, possibly the king himself. In the Shang dynasty circa 1600 1050 BC, the supreme deity was Shangdi, but aristocratic families preferred to contact the spirits of their ancestors. They prepared elaborate banquets of food and drink for them, heated and served in bronze ritual vessels. These bronze vessels had many shapes depending on their purpose, for wine, water, cereals, or meat, and some of them were marked with readable characters, which shows the development of writing. This kind of vessels of a very high quality and complexity were discovered on the valley of the Yellow River in the Hainan province in sites like Erlito, Anyang, or Zingzo. They were used in religious rituals to cement the Deng authority, and when the Shang capital fell around 1050 BC, its conquerors, the Zhu circa 1050-156 BCE, continued to use these containers in religious rituals, but principally for food rather than drink. The Shang court had been accused of excessive drunkenness, and the Zhu promoting the imperial Tian, heaven, as the prime spiritual force rather than ancestors limited wine and religious rites in favor of food. The use of ritual bronzes continued into the early Han Dynasty, 206 BC, 220 AD. One of the most commonly used motifs was the Teoti, a stylized face divided centrally into two almost mirror image halves, with nostrils, eyes, eyebrows, jaws, cheeks, and horns surrounded by incised patterns. Whether Teoti represented real, mythological, or wholly imaginary creatures cannot be determined. The enigmatic bronzes of Sangxing Dewey near Guanghan in Sichuan province are evidence for a mysterious sacrificial religious system unlike anything elsewhere in ancient China and quite different from the art of the contemporaneous Shang at Anyang. Excavations at Sangxing Dewey since 1986 have revealed four pits containing artifacts of bronze, jade, and gold. There was found a great bronze statue of a human figure which stands on a plinth decorated with abstract elephant heads. Besides the standing figure, the first two pits contained over 50 bronze heads, some wearing headgear and three with a frontal covering of gold leaf. Tubular bronze fragments with little branches were discovered here as well, probably representing trees and also bronze leaves, fruits and birds. Over 4,000 objects were found at Sangxing Dewey in 1986, succeeding the Shang Dynasty Zhu 1050-221 BC, ruled more than any other one from Chinese history. Its last centuries were characterized by violence, the era being known as the Warring States period. During this troubling time, some philosophical movements appeared. Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism. The Warring States period was ended by Qin Shi Huangdi, who united China in 221 BC. He ordered a huge tomb guarded by the Terracotta Army. Another huge project was a predecessor of the Great Wall, erected for rejecting pillaging tribes from the north. After the death of the emperor, his dynasty, the Qin 221-206 BC, lasted only three years. Qin Shi Huangdi was followed by the Han Dynasty, 202 BC, Q 102 BC, 228, during which the Silk Road developed considerably, bringing new cultural influences in China. Through harmonious proportion and a focus on aesthetics, ancient Greek and Roman art became the foundation and inspiration of all Western art, being the standard to which most European artists aspired, until the 19th century. The Latin poet Horace, writing in the age of Roman Emperor Augustus, 1st century BC to 1st century AD, famously remarked that although conquered on the battlefield, captive Greece overcame its savage conqueror and brought the arts to rustic Rome. 
The power of Greek art lies in its representation of the human figure and its focus on human beings and the anthropomorphic gods as chief subjects. The artworks of the Greeks were meant to decorate temples and public buildings, to celebrate battle victories and remarkable personalities, and to commemorate the dead. They were also given as offerings to the gods. Although there was no definitive transition, the art is usually divided stylistically into the four periods of geometric, archaic, classical, and Hellenistic. During the classical period, 5th and 4th centuries BCE, realism and idealism were delicately balanced. In comparison, the works of the earlier geometric 9th to 8th centuries BCE and archaic 7th to 6th centuries BC, ages can seem appear primitive, but these artists had different goals. Naturalistic representation was not necessarily their aim. Greek and artists built on the artistic foundations of Egypt, further developing the arts of sculpture, painting, architecture, and ceramics. Among the techniques they perfected include methods of carving and casting sculptures, fresco painting, and building magnificent buildings. Roman art lovers collected ancient Greek originals, Roman replicas of Greek art, or newly created paintings and sculptures fashioned in a variety of Greek styles, thus preserving for posterity works of art otherwise lost. Wall and panel paintings, sculptures, and mosaics decorated public spaces and private homes. Greek imagery also appeared on Roman jewelry, vessels of gold, silver, bronze, and terracotta, and even on weapons and commercial weights. Rediscovered during the early Renaissance, the arts of ancient Greece, transmitted through the Roman Empire, have served as the foundation of Western art until the 19th century, since the advent of the Classical Age in Athens. In the 5th century BC, the classical way of building has been deeply woven into Western understanding of architecture and indeed of civilization itself. From circa 850 BC to circa 300 AD, ancient Greek culture flourished on the Greek mainland, on the Peloponnese, and on the Aegean islands. Five of the wonders of the world were Greek. The Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, and the Lighthouse of Alexandria. However, Ancient Greek architecture is best known for its temples, many of which are found throughout the region, and the Parthenon is a prime example of this. Later, they will serve as inspiration for neoclassical architects during the late 18th and the 19th century. The most well-known temples are the Parthenon and the Erechtheion, both on the Acropolis of Athens. Another type of important ancient Greek buildings were the theaters. Both temples and theaters used a complex mix of optical illusions and balanced ratios. Looking at the archaeological remains of ancient buildings, it is easy to perceive them as limestone and concrete in a gray top pone and to make the assumption that ancient buildings were monochromatic. However, architecture was polychromed in much of the ancient world. One of the most iconic ancient buildings, the Parthenon circa 447-432 BCE, in Athens had details painted with vibrant reds, blues, and greens. Besides ancient temples, medieval cathedrals were never completely white. Most had colored highlights on capitals and columns. This practice of coloring buildings and artworks was abandoned during the early Renaissance. This is because Leonardo da Vinci and other Renaissance artists, including Michelangelo, promoted a color palette inspired by the ancient Greco-Roman ruins, which because of neglect and constant decay during the Middle Ages, became white despite being initially colorful. The pigments used in the ancient world were delicate and especially susceptible to weathering. Without necessary care, the colors exposed to rain, snow, dirt, and other factors vanished over time, and this way ancient buildings and artworks became white like they are today and were during the Renaissance. No civilization has had an impact as enduring and powerful on Western art as the Roman Empire. The legacy of ancient Rome is evident through the medieval and early modern periods, and Roman art continued to be reused in the modern era in both traditionalist and postmodern artworks. Sometimes it is viewed as derived from Greek precedents, but also has its own distinguishing features, some of them inherited from Etruscan art. Roman sculpture is often less idealized than its Greek precedents, being very realistic. Roman architecture often used concrete, and features such as the round arch and dome were invented. 
Luxury objects in metalwork, gem engraving, ivory carvings, and glass are sometimes considered in modern terms to be minor forms of Roman art, although this would not necessarily have been the case for contemporaries. An innovation made possible by the Roman development of glass blowing was cameo glass. A white shell was first created, into which colored glass was then blown so as to produce an interior lining. The white shell was then cut down to create relief patterns of white against a darker background. They also made mosaics this way producing durable pictorial art with cut stone cubes, tisserae, and or chips of colored terracotta and glass. Some villas of wealthy Romans had their walls covered with frescoes aimed at dazzling and entertaining guests. Much of Roman wall painting that survives comes from sites around the Bay of Naples, in particular Pompeii and Herculaneum, thriving towns that were preserved under meters of volcanic debris when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. As a result, Roman wall painting is often discussed in terms of four Pompeian styles. The Romans were deeply influenced by all aspects of Hellenistic culture, in architecture, just like in other art media, they essentially adopted the classical language and adapted the classical language and adapted it to new situations and uses. The Romans also have their own innovations brought to classical architecture. They used the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders in a far freer manner than the Greeks had, creating their own version of the Doric and using the Corinthian far more frequently. They also added two new orders to the repertoire. The Tuscan, a simpler, more massive version of the Doric derived from Etruscan architecture, and the composite, a combination of the scroll-like volutes of the Ionic with the Corinthians' acanthus leaves. Other important innovations include the arch and the dome. Using arches, they built aqueducts and monumental triumphal arches. Roman emperors were proud of their conquests and commemorated them at home and in the conquered territories through triumphal arches, a good example of this being the Arch of Constantine in Rome. Between 30 and 15 BC, the architect and civil and military engineer Marcus Vitruvius Pollio published a major treatise, De Architectura, which influenced architects around the world for centuries. After the Middle Ages, with the Renaissance that started in Florence, Ailey, a growing interest for ancient Rome started. During it, for the first time since classical antiquity, Art became convincingly lifelike. The Renaissance also sparked interest for ancient Greek and Roman literature, not just for art and architecture. Islamic art is well known since the Middle Ages for the use of elaborate geometric patterns, colorful tiles, stylized natural motifs, and detailed calligraphy. Rarely has lettering had such a profound impact on applied arts and architecture. Islam appeared in Western Arabia in the 7th century AD through revelations delivered to the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca. Within a century of Muhammad's death, the Islamic empires controlled the Middle East, Spain, and parts of Asia and Africa. Because of this, similarly with Roman art, Islamic art and architecture had regional versions. As the Islamic world extended into centers of late antique culture, it was enriched by philosophical and intellectual movements. The translation of Greek works into Arabic and advances in mathematics and science were encouraged by early caliphates. This is in contrast with the modern perception that Islamic art is dogmatic and unchanging. Human and animal representation wasn't rare. Only certain periods restricted it, similar with the Byzantine iconoclasm. Some of the first great civilizations in the Americas developed in Mesoamerica, meaning Middle Americas, the most well-known being the Mayans and the Aztecs. The Olmecs, circa 1400, 400 BC, were the first major civilization in modern-day Mexico. Many elements of Mesoamerican civilizations, like the practice of building of pyramids, the complex calendar, the pantheon of gods and hieroglyphic writing, have origins in Olmec culture. They produced jade and ceramic figurines, colossal heads and pyramids with temples at the top, all without the advantage of metal tools. For them, jadeite was a stone more precious than gold and symbolized divine powers and fertility. Seventeen Olmec colossal heads have been discovered, each weighing a few tons. Each head, with the flattened nose and thick lips, wears a helmet, similar with the ones worn during official ball games, possibly representing kings of officials. The Maya civilization began around 1800 BC. 
and grew until the arrival of Spanish colonizers in the 1500s. They occupied southeast Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and parts of Honduras and El Salvador. The Mayans were trading with cities like Teotihuacan, but also with many Mesoamerican civilizations like the Zapotecs or the other groups from central or coast areas of Mexico, and also with populations that did not inhabit Mesoamerican territories, like the Taino from the Caribbean. They produced impressive king portraits, polychrome ceramic vessels, earthenware figures, wooden sculptures, stelas, and built complex cities with pyramids. Most of the well-preserved polychrome ceramic vessels were discovered in the tombs of nobles. Arising from humble beginnings as a nomadic group, the Aztecs created the largest empire in Mesoamerican history, lasting from 1427 to 1527 to 1520. 1. They did not call themselves Aztecs, but Mexica. The term Aztecs was assigned by historians. They transformed the capital of their empire, Tenochtitlan, into a place where artists of Mesoamerica created impressive artworks for their new masters. The present-day Mexico City was built over the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan. Similarly with Mesoamerica, the present-day territory of Colombia is an area where multiple cultures developed before the arrival of Spanish colonizers. Here, gold body accessories were produced, many golden ones, but also many other ones made of tumbaga a non-specific alloy of gold and copper given by Spanish conquistadors to metals composed of these elements found in widespread use in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, in North America, and South America. The ancient civilizations of Peru and Bolivia nurtured unique artistic traditions, including one of the world's most aesthetically impressive fiber art traditions. Two of the first important cultures from this land are the Chevan and the Paracas culture. The Paracas culture of the south coast of Peru is best known for its complex pattern textiles, particularly mantles. The Moshe controlled the river valleys of the north coast, while the Nazca of southern Peru held sway along the coastal deserts and contiguous mountains. The Nazca are best known for the famous Nazca Lines, a group of geoglyphs in a desert in southern Peru. They also produced polychrome ceramics and textiles influenced by the Paracas and used a palette of at least 10 colors for their pottery. Both cultures flourished around 100-800 AD. Moshi pottery is some of the most varied in the world. In the north, the Warai or Huari Empire are noted for their stone architecture and sculpture accomplishments. The Chimu were preceded by a simple ceramic style known as Sikan 700-900 AD. The Chimu produced excellent portrait and decorative works in metal, notably gold but especially silver. Later, the Inca Empire, 1100, 1533, stretched across the Andes Mountains. They crafted precious metal figurines and, like other civilizations from the same area, complex textiles. The llamas were important animals because of their wool and for carrying loads. Eastern civilization broadly includes Asia, and it also includes a complex tradition of art making. One approach to Eastern art history divides the field by nation with foci on Indian art, Chinese art, and Japanese art, and Japanese art. Due to the size of the continent, the distinction between Eastern Asia and Southern Asia in the context of arts can be clearly seen. In most of Asia, pottery was a prevalent form of art. The pottery is often decorated with geometric patterns or abstract representations of animals, people, or plants. Other very widespread forms of art were, and are, sculpture and painting. Central Asian art developed in Central Asia in areas corresponding to modern Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and parts of modern Mongolia, China, and Russia. The art of ancient and medieval Central Asia reflects the rich history of this vast area, home to a huge variety of peoples, religions, and ways of life. The artistic remains of the region show a remarkable combinations of influences that exemplify the multicultural nature of Central Asian society. The Silk Road transmission of art, Scythian art, Greco-Buddhist art, Serendian art, and more recently Persianate culture are all part of this complicated history. Central Asia has always been a crossroads of cultural exchange, the hub of the so-called Silk Road, 
that complex system of trade routes stretching from China to the Mediterranean. Already in the Bronze Age, 3rd and 2nd millennium BC, growing settlements formed part of an extensive network of trade linking Central Asia to the Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Early Buddhists in India developed symbols related to Buddha. The major survivals of Buddhist art begin in the period after the Mauryans, within North India, Kushan art, the Greco-Buddhist art of Gandhara, and finally the classic period of Gupta art. Additionally, there was the Anhar school which appeared before the Gandhara school and which was based in South India. Good quantities of sculpture survives from some key sites such as Sanchi, Barhut, and Amaravati, some of which remain in situ with others in museums in India or around the world. Stupas were surrounded by ceremonial fences with four profusely carved taranas or ornamental gateways facing the cardinal directions. These are in stone, though clearly adopting forms developed in wood. They and the walls of the stupa itself can be heavily decorated with reliefs, mostly illustrating the lives of the Buddha. Gradually, life-size figures were sculpted initially in deep relief, but then freestanding. Mathura art was the most important center in this development which applied to Hindu and Jain art as well as Buddhist. The facades and interiors of rock-cut Chaitya prayer halls and monastic viharas have survived better than similar freestanding structures elsewhere, which were for long mostly in wood. The caves at Ajante, Karl, Baja, and elsewhere contain early sculpture, often outnumbered by later works such as iconic figures of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, which are not found before 100 AD, at the least. In Eastern Asia, painting was derived from the practice of calligraphy and portraits and landscapes were painted on silk cloth. Most of the paintings represent landscapes or portraits. The most spectacular sculptures are the ritual bronzes and the bronze sculptures from Sangsingui. A very well-known example of Chinese art is the Terracotta Army, depicting the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. It is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor in 210-209 BC, whose purpose was to protect the emperor in his afterlife. Chinese art is one of the oldest continuous traditional arts in the world and is marked by an unusual degree of continuity within and consciousness of that tradition, lacking an equivalent to the Western collapse and gradual recovery of classical styles. The media that have usually been classified in the West since the Renaissance as the decorative arts are extremely important in Chinese art, and much of the finest work was produced in large workshops or factories by essentially unknown artists, especially in Chinese ceramics, especially in Chinese ceramics. The range and quality of goods that decorated Chinese palaces and households and their inhabitants is dazzling. Materials came from across China and far beyond gold and silver, mother of pearl, ivory and rhinoceros horn, wood and lacquer, jade and soapstone, silk and paper. Japanese art covers a wide range of art styles and media, including ancient pottery, sculpture, ink painting and calligraphy on silk and paper, ukiyo-e paintings and woodblock prints, ceramics, origami and more recently manga, modern Japanese cartooning and comics, along with a myriad of other ties. The first settlers of Japan, the Jomon people, circa 11,300 BC. They crafted lavishly decorated pottery storage vessels, clay figurines called dog. Japan has been subject to sudden invasions of new ideas, followed by long periods of minimal contact with the outside world. Over time, the Japanese developed the ability to absorb, imitate, and finally assimilate those elements of foreign culture that complemented their aesthetic preferences. The earliest complex art in Japan was produced in the 7th and 8th centuries in connection with Buddhism. In the 9th century, as the Japanese began to turn away from China and develop indigenous forms of expression, the secular arts became increasingly important. Until the late 15th century, both religious and secular arts flourished. After the Onin War, 1467, 1477, Japan entered a period of political, social, and economic disruption that lasted for over a century. In the state that emerged under the leadership of the Tokugawa shogunate, organized religion played a much less important role in people's lives, and the arts that survived were primarily secular. Sub-Saharan African art includes both sculpture typified by the brass castings of the Benin people, 
Igbo Uku, and the Kingdom of Aif and terracottas of Dijen Genoaife, and the more ancient Nott culture, as well as folk art. Concurrent with the European Middle Ages, in the 11th century AD, a nation that made grand architecture, gold sculpture, and intricate jewelry was founded in Great Zimbabwe. Impressive sculpture was concurrently being cast from brass by the Yoruba people of what is now Nigeria. In the Benin Kingdom, also of southern Nigeria, which began around the same time, elegant altar tusks, brass heads, plaques of brass, and palatial architecture were created. The Benin Kingdom was ended by the British in 1897, and little of the culture's art now remains in Nigeria. Today, the most significant arts venue in Africa is the Johannesburg Biennale. Sub-Saharan Africa is characterized by a high density of cultures. Notable are the Dogon people from Mali, Edo, Yoruba, Igbo people and the Nok civilization from Nigeria, Kuba and Luba people from Central Africa, Ashanti people from Ghana, Zulu people from Southern Africa, and Fang people from Equatorial Guinea. 85. Cameroon and Gabon, the Seo civilization, people from Chad. Quell people from Eastern Gabon, Republic of the Congo and Cameroon. The myriad forms of African art are components of some of the most vibrant and responsive artistic traditions in the world and are integral to the lives of African people. Created for specific purposes, artworks can reveal their ongoing importance through physical transformations that enhance both their appearance and their potency. Many traditional African art forms are created as conduits to the spirit world and change appearance as materials are added to enhance their beauty and potency. The more a work is used and blessed, the more abstract it becomes with the accretion of sacrificial matter and the wearing down of original details. The art of Oceania includes the geographic areas of Micronesia, Polynesia, Australia, New Zealand, and Melanesia. One approach treats the area thematically with foci on ancestry, warfare, the body, gender, trade, religion, and tourism. Unfortunately, little ancient art survives from Oceania. Scholars believe that this is likely because artists used perishable materials, such as wood and feathers, which did not survive in the tropical climate, and there are no historical records to refer to most of this material. The understanding of Oceania's artistic cultures thus begins with the documentation of it by Westerners such as Captain James Cook in the 18th century. At the turn of the 20th century, the French artist Paul Gauguin spent significant amounts of time in Tahiti, living with local people and making modern art, a fact that has become intertwined with Tahitian visual culture to the present day. The indigenous art of Australia often looks like abstract modern art, but it has deep roots in local culture. The art of Oceania is the last great tradition of art to be appreciated by the world at large. Despite being one of the longest continuous traditions of art in the world dating back at least 50 millennia, it remained relatively unknown until the second half of the 20th century. The often ephemeral materials of Aboriginal art of Australia makes it difficult to determine the antiquity of the majority of the forms of art practiced today. The most durable forms are the multitudes of rock engravings and rock paintings and rock paintings which are found across the continent. In the Arnhem Land escarpment, evidence suggests that paintings were being made 50,000 years ago, antedating the Paleolithic rock paintings of Altamira Lascaux in Europe. With the decline of the Roman Empire in circa 300 AD, the medieval era began, lasting for about a millennium, until the beginning of the Renaissance in circa 1400. Early Christian art begins the period, followed by Byzantine art, Anglo-Saxon art, Viking art, Ottonian art, Ottonian art, Romanesque art, and Gothic art, with Islamic art dominating the Eastern Mediterranean. Medieval art grew out of the artistic heritage of the Roman Empire and Byzantium, mixed with the barbarian artistic culture of Northern Europe, in Byzantine and Gothic art of the Middle Ages. The dominance of the church resulted in a large amount of religious art. There was extensive use of gold in paintings, which presented figures in simplified forms. Byzantine art refers to the body of Christian Greek artistic products of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire, as well as the nations and states that inherited culturally from the empire. Though the empire itself emerged from Rome's decline and lasted until the fall of Constantinople in 1453, 
the start date of the Byzantine period is rather clearer in art history than in political history than in political history, if still imprecise. Many Eastern Orthodox states in Eastern Europe, as well as to some degree the Muslim states of the Eastern Mediterranean, preserve many aspects of the empire's culture and art for centuries afterward. Surviving Byzantine art is mostly religious and with exceptions at certain periods is highly conventionalized, following traditional models that translate carefully controlled church theology into artistic terms. Painting in fresco, illuminated manuscripts and on wood panel and, especially in earlier periods, mosaic were the main media, and figurative sculpture very rare except for small carved ivories. Manuscript painting preserved to the end some of the classical realist tradition that was missing in larger works. Byzantine art was highly prestigious and sought after in Western Europe, where it maintained a continuous influence on medieval art, where it maintained a continuous influence on medieval art until near the end of the period. This was especially so in Italy, where Byzantine styles persisted in modified form through the 12th century and became formative influences on Italian Renaissance art but few incoming influences affected the Byzantine style. With the expansion of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Byzantine forms and styles spread throughout the Orthodox world and beyond. Influences from Byzantine architecture, particularly in religious buildings, can be found in diverse regions from Egypt and Arabia to Russia and Romania. Byzantine architecture is notorious for the use of domes, it also often featured marble columns, coffered ceilings, and sumptuous decoration, including the extensive use of mosaics with golden backgrounds. The building material used by Byzantine architects was no longer marble, which was very appreciated by the ancient Greeks. They used mostly stone and brick, and also thin alabaster sheets for windows. Mosaics were used to cover brick walls and any other surface where fresco wouldn't resist. Good examples of mosaics from the Proto-Byzantine era are in Hagios Demetrios in Thessaloniki, Greece, the Basilica of Santa Polinar Nuovo, and the Basilica of San Vital, both in Ravenna, Italy, and Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Greco-Roman temples and Byzantine churches differ substantially in terms of their exterior and interior aspect. In antiquity, the exterior was the most important part of the temple, because in the interior, where the cult statue of the deity to whom the temple was built was kept, only the priest had access. The ceremonies here held outside, and what the worshippers view was the facade of the temple, consisting of columns with an entablature and two pediments. Meanwhile, Christian liturgies were held in the interior of the churches, the exterior usually having little to no ornamentation. Ottonian art is a style in pre-Romanesque German art, covering also some works from the Low Countries, Northern Italy, and Eastern France. It was named by the art historian Hubert Janicek after the Ottonian dynasty, which ruled Germany and northern Italy between 919 and 1024 under the kings Henry I, Otto I, Otto I, Otto I, Otto II, Otto III, and Henry II. With Ottonian architecture, it is a key component of the Ottonian Renaissance, circa 951-1024. However, the style neither began nor ended to neatly coincide with the rule of the dynasty. It emerged some decades into their rule and persisted past the Ottonian emperors into the reigns of the early Salian dynasty, which lacks an artistic style label of its own. In the traditional scheme of art history, Ottonian art follows Carolingian art and precedes Romanesque art, though the transitions at both ends of the period are gradual rather than sudden. Like the former and unlike the latter, it was very largely a style restricted to a few of the small cities of the period and important monasteries, as well as the court circles of the emperor and his leading vassals. After the decline of the Carolingian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire was re-established under the Saxon Ottonian dynasty. From this emerged a renewed faith in the idea of empire and a reformed church, creating a period of heightened cultural and artistic fervor. It was in this atmosphere that masterpieces were created that fused the traditions from which Ottonian artists derived their inspiration, models of late antique, Carolinian, and Byzantine origin. Surviving Ottonian art is very largely religious, in the form of illuminated manuscripts and metalwork, and was produced in a small number of centers for a narrow range of patrons in the circle of the imperial court, as well as important figures in the church. 
however much of it was designed for display to a wider public, especially of pilgrims. The style is generally grand and heavy sometimes to excess, and initially less sophisticated than the Carolingian equivalents, with less direct influence from Xantine art and less understanding of its classical models, but around 1,000 a striking intensity and expressiveness emerge in many works as a solemn monumentality is combined with a vibrant inwardness and unworldly visionary quality with sharp attention to actuality, surface patterns of flowing lines and rich bright colors with passionate emotionalism. The Romanesque was the first pan-European style to emerge after the Roman Empire spanning the mid-10th century to the 13th. The period saw a resurgence of monumental stone structures with complex structural programs. Romanesque churches are characterized by rigid articulation and geometric clarity incorporated into a unified volumetric whole. The architecture is austere but enlivened by decorative sculpting of capitals and portals as well as frescoed interiors. Geometric and foliate patterning gives way to increasingly three-dimensional figurative sculpture. St. St. Michael's Church, Hildesheim, Germany, 1001-1030 is seen as a proto-Romanesque church. From the mid-11th to the early 13th centuries, Romanesque paintings were two-dimensional, defined by bold linear outlines and geometry, particularly in the handling of drapery, symmetry, and frontality, were emphasized. Virtually all Western churches were painted, but probably only a few wall painters were monks. Instead, itinerant artists carried out most of this work. Basic blocking out was done on wet plaster with earth colors. A limited palette, dominated by white, red, yellow ochres and azure, was employed for maximum visual effect, with dense coloring forming a backdrop of bands, a practice that originated in late classical art as an attempt to distinguish earth and sky. During the later 11th and 12th centuries, the great age of Western monasticism, Europe experienced unprecedented economic, social, and political change, leading to burgeoning wealth among landowners, including monasteries. There was increasing demand for books, and economic wealth allowed many manuscripts to be richly illuminated. One of the outstanding artifacts of the age is the 70M Long Bayou Tapestry. It depicts the events leading up to the Norman conquest of England with protagonist William, Duke of Normandy, and Harold, Earl of Wessex, later King of England, and Harold, Earl of Wessex, later King of England, and culminating in the Battle of Hastings. It is thought to date from the 11th century. It tells the story from the point of view of the conquering Normans, but is now agreed to have been made in England, most likely by women, although the designer is unknown. It is housed in France. Gothic art developed in northern France out of Romanesque in the 12th century AD and led by the concurrent development of Gothic architecture. It spread to all of Western Europe and much of Southern and Central Europe, never quite effacing more classical styles in Italy. In the late 14th century, the sophisticated court style of international Gothic developed, which continued to evolve until the late 15th century the imposing Gothic cathedrals, with their sculptural programs and stained glass windows, epitomize the Gothic style. It differs from Romanesque through its rib-shaped vaults and the use of ogives. Instead of the thick Romanesque walls, Gothic buildings are thin and tall. Spiral stairs and towers are specific to Gothic architecture. Gothic painting, much of it executed in tempera and later oils on panel, as well as fresco and with an increasingly broad palette of secondary colors, is generally seen as more naturalistic than Romanesque. The humanity of religious narrative was highlighted, and the emotional state of the characters individualized. The increased urbanity of the medieval economy and the rise of the clerical and lay patrons saw a change in the nature of the art market, which can be seen in developments in Gothic manuscript illumination. Workshops employed specialists for different elements of the page, such as figures or marginal vine motifs. Encompassing early Northern and High Renaissance, the term Renaissance describes the rebirth in Europe of a new interest for classical antiquity. For the first time since antiquity, art became convincingly lifelike. Besides the ancient past, Renaissance artists also studied nature, understanding the human body, animals, plants, space, perspective, and the qualities of light. 
The most common theme were religious subjects, but depictions of mythological stories were produced as well. Also, there was no uniform Renaissance style. Each artist developed their own distinct visual language, influenced by their predecessors and contemporaries. The early Renaissance was a period of great creative and intellectual activity when artists broke away completely from the parameters of Byzantine art. It is generally accepted that it started in Florence in present-day Italy in the early 15th century. It is characterized by a surge of interest in classical literature, philosophy, and art, the growth of commerce, the discovery of new continents, and new inventions. There was a revival of interest in the art and literature of ancient Rome, and the study of ancient Greek and Latin texts instigated concepts of individualism and reason, which became known as humanism. Humanists considered life in the present and emphasized the importance of individual thought, which affected artists' approaches. Despite being highly associated with Italy, particularly with Florence, Rome, and Venice, the rest of Western Europe participated to the Renaissance as well. The Northern Renaissance occurred in Europe north of the Alps from the early 15th century, following a period of artistic cross-fertilization between North and South, known as International Gothis. There was a big difference between the Northern and Italian Renaissance. The North artists did not seek to revive the values of ancient Greece and Rome like the Italians, while in the South Italian artists and patrons were amazed by the empirical study of nature and the human society of nature and the human society and by the deep colors that northern artists could achieve in the newly developed medium of oil paint. The Protestant Reformation increased the northern interest in secular painting, like portraits or landscapes. Two key northern artists are Hieronymus Bosch, known for his surreal paintings filled with hybrid creatures like the Garden of Earthly Delights, and Albrecht Dürer, who brought the new art of printmaking to a new level. The High Renaissance took place in the late 15th, early 16th centuries and was influenced by the fact that as papal power stabilized in Rome, several popes commissioned art and architecture determined to recreate the city's former glory. Raphael and Michelangelo produced vast and grandiose projects for the popes. The most famous artwork of this part of the Renaissance is probably the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Mannerism broke away from High Renaissance ideals of harmony and a rational approach to art to embrace exaggerated forms, elongated proportions, and more vibrant colors. It developed in Italy between 1510 and 1520 among artists who prized originality above all. The name of this movement comes from the Italian maniera, meaning style or manner. The word was meant to describe the standard of excellence achieved during the High Renaissance, to which all art should now adhere, but in practice it led to stylization and art to show art sometimes with great success, an example being Raphael's pupil Giulio Romano. Mannerism has also been used more generally to describe a period following the Renaissance and preceding the Baroque. The 17th century was a period of volatile change both in science, through inventions and developments, such as the telescope or the microscope, and in religion, as the Catholic Counter-Reformation contested the growing popularity of Protestant faith. After the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church reacted with the Counter-Reformation, decreeing that art should inspire viewers with passionate religious themes, succeeding mannerism and developing as a result of religious tensions across Europe. Baroque art emerged in the late 16th century. The name may derive from Barocco, the Portuguese word for misshaped pearl, and it describes art that combined emotion, dynamism, and drama with powerful color, realism, and strong tonal contrasts. Between 1545 and 1563 at the Council of Trent, it was decided that religious art must encourage piety, realism, and accuracy, and by attracting viewers' attention and empathy, glorify the Catholic Church and strengthen the image of Catholic Church and strengthen the image of Catholicism. In the next century, the radical new styles of Baroque art both embraced and developed high Renaissance models and broke new ground both in religious art and in new varieties of secular art. Above all landscape, the Baroque and its late variant, the Rococo, were the first truly global styles in the arts, dominating more than two centuries of art and architecture in Europe, Latin America, and beyond from circa 1580 to circa 1750. Born in the painting studios of Bologna and Rome in the 1580s and 1590s, 
and in Roman sculptural and architectural ateliers in the second and third decades of the 17th century, the Baroque spread swiftly throughout Italy, Spain and Portugal, Flanders, France, the Netherlands, England, Scandinavia, and Russia, as well as to Central and Eastern European centers from Munich, Germany, to Vilnius, Lithuania. The Portuguese, Spanish, and French empires and the Dutch treading network had a leading role in spreading the two styles into the Americas and colonial Africa and Asia, to places such as Lima, Mozambique, Goa, and the Philippines. Just like paintings and sculptures, Baroque cathedrals and palaces are characterized by the use of illusion and drama as well. They also frequently use dramatic effects of light and shade and have sumptuous, highly decorated interiors that blurred the boundaries between architecture, painting, and sculpture. Another important characteristic of Baroque architecture was the presence of dynamism done through curves, Solomonic columns, and ovals. In France, Baroque is synonymous with the reign of Louis XIV between 1643 and 1715, since multiple monumental buildings were built in Paris, Versailles, and other parts of France during his rule, such as the Palace of Versailles, the Chateau de Maisons, the Chateau de vaux le vonte the Chateau de vaux le vonte the Louvre, Colonnade or the Dome des Invalides, Besides the building itself, the space where it was placed has a role too. Baroque buildings try to seize viewers' attention and to dominate their surroundings, whether on a small scale such as the San Carlo alle Quattro Fontaine in Rome, or on a massive one like the new facade of the Santiago di Compostela Cathedral, designed to tower over the city. Applied arts prospered during this period as well. Baroque furniture could be as bombastic as the rooms they were meant to adorn, and their motifs and techniques were carefully calibrated to coordinate with the architect's overall decorative program. One of the most prestigious furniture makers was André Charles Boulle, known for his marquetry technique, made by gluing sheets of tortoiseshell and brass together and cut to form the design. His works were also adorned with gilded bronze mounts. Complex Gobelins tapestries featured scenes inspired by classical antiquity, and the Savonnerie manufactory produced big, highly detailed carpets for the Louvre. These carpets with black or yellow backgrounds had a central motif or a medallion. Chinese porcelain, delftware, and mirrors fabricated at St. Gobain, France, spread rapidly in all princely palaces and aristocratic residences in France. During the reign of Louis XI, big mirrors are put above fireplace mantles, and this trend will last long after the Baroque period. Originating in circa 1720 Paris, Rococo is characterized by natural motifs soft colors, curving lines, asymmetry, and themes including love, nature, and lighthearted entertainment. Its ideals were delicacy, gaiety, youthfulness, and sensuality. Beginning in France as a reaction against the heavy Baroque grandeur of Louis XIV's court at the Palace of Versailles, the Rococo movement became associated particularly with the powerful Madame de Pompadour, 1721. 1764, the mistress of the new King Louis X V V. 1774. Because of this, the style was also known as Pompadour. The name of the movement derives from the French rocaille or pebble and refers to stones and shells that decorate the interiors of caves, as similar shell forms became a common feature in Rococo design. It began as a design and decorative art style and was characterized by elegant flowing shapes. Architecture followed and then painting and sculpture. The French painted with whom the term Rococo is most often associated is Jean-Antoine Watteau, whose pastoral scenes, or fête escalantes, dominate the early part of the 18th century. Although there are some important Bavarian churches in this style, such as the Weisskirche, Rococo is most often associated with secular buildings, principally great palaces and salons where educated elites would meet to discuss literary and philosophical ideas. In Paris, its popularity coincided with the emergence of the salon as a new type of social gathering, the venues for which were often decorated in the Rococo style. Among the most characteristically elegant and refined examples is the Salon Oval de la Princesse of the Hotel de Soubise, one of the most beautiful 18th century mansions in Paris. The Rococo introduced dramatic changes to elite furniture as it favored smaller pieces with narrow sinewy frames and more delicate, often asymmetrical decoration, often including elements of chinoiserie. The taste for Far Eastern objects, mainly Chinese, 
lead to the use of Chinese painted and lacquered panels for furniture. The movement spread quickly throughout Europe and as far as Ottoman Turkey and China thanks to ornament books featuring cartouches, arabesques and shell work, as well as designs for wall panels and fireplaces. The most popular were made by Justin Ariel Missonnier, 1695-1750, Jacques-François Blondel, 1705-1774, Pierre-Edmé Babel, 1720-75, and Francois de 1775, and Francois de Covelis, 1695-1768. Inspired by the excavations of the ancient Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum from 1748, a renewed interest in the arts of antiquity occurred. Neoclassicism dominates Western art from the mid to late 18th century until the 1830s. Embracing order and restraint, it developed in reaction to the perceived frivolity, hedonism and decadence of Rococo, and exemplifying the rational thinking of the Age of Enlightenment. Okay the age of reason. Initially, the movement was developed not by artists but by Enlightenment philosophers. They requested replacing Rococo with a style of rational art, moral and dedicated to the soul. This fitted well with a perception of classical art as the embodiment of realism, restraint and order. Inspired by ancient Greek and Roman art, the classical history paintings of the French artist Nicolas Poussin, 1594-1665, and the ideas of the German writer Anton Raphael Mengs, 1728, 1728, 1779, and the archaeologist and art historian Johann Joachim Winkelmann, 1717, 1717, 17, but soon spread throughout Europe. Rome had become the main focus of the Grand Tour by the mid-18th century, and aristocratic travelers went there in search of classical visions to recreate on their country estates, thus spreading the style across Europe particularly in England and France. The tour was also an opportunity for collecting classical antiquities. Neoclassical paintings tended to be populated with figures posed like classical statues or reliefs set in locations filled with archaeological details. The style favored Greek art over Roman, considering it purer and more authentically classical in its aesthetic goal. In 1789, France was on the brink of its first revolution and neoclassicism sought to express their patriotic feelings. Politics and art were closely entwined during this period. They believed that art should be serious and valued drawings above painting. Smooth contours and paint with no discernible brushstrokes were the ultimate aim. Both painting and sculpture exerted calmness and restraint and focused on heroic themes, expressing such noble notions as self-sacrifice and nationalism. This movement paved the way for Romanticism, that appeared when the idealism of the revolution faded away and after the Napoleonic period came to an end in the early 19th century. Neoclassicism should not be seen as the opposite of Romanticism, however, but in some ways an early manifestation of it. Many art historians place the origins of modern art in the late 18th century, others in the mid-19th century. Art historian H. Harvard Arneson stated a gradual metamorphosis took place in the course of a hundred years. Events such as the Age of Enlightenment, revolutions and democracies in America and France, and the Industrial Revolution had far-reaching effects in Western culture. People, commodities, ideas, and information could travel between countries and continents with unprecedented speed and these changes were reflected in the arts. The invention of photography in the 1830s further altered certain aspects of art, particularly painting. By the dawn of the 19th century, a long and gradual paradigm shift was complete. From the Gothic, when artists were viewed as craftsmen in the service of the church and monarchies, to the idea of art for art's sake, where the ideas and visions of the individual artists were held in the high regard, with patronage from an increasingly literate, affluent, and urban middle and upper class population that had been emerging for 200 years, particularly in Paris and London. A dichotomy began in the late 18th century between neoclassicism and romanticism that subdivided and continued to run through virtually every new movement in modern art. Spreading like waves, these isms defy national, ethnic, and chronological boundaries never dominant anywhere for long, they compete or merge with each other in endlessly shifting patterns, 
modern art has consistently moved toward international influences and exchanges, from the exotic curiosity of Orientalism, the deeper influence of Japer influence of Japanism, to the arts of Oceania, Africa, and the Americas. Conversely, modern art has increasingly extended beyond Western Europe. In Russia and the U.S., the arts were developing to a degree that rivaled the leading European countries by the end of the 19th century. Many of the major movements appeared in Latin America, Australia, and Asia too, and geography and nationality became increasingly insignificant with each passing decade. By the 20th century, important and influential artists were emerging around the world. E. Fujita, Japan, Arshil Gorky, Armenia, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo, Mexico, Wilfredo Lamb, Cuba, Edvard Munch, Norwegian, Roberto Matachilian, Mark Rothko, Lithuanian American, Fernando Botero Anglo, Colombia, Constantin Brancusi, and Victor Bruner Renata. Romanticism emerged in the late 18th century out of the German Sturm und Drang movement and flourished in the first half of the 19th century with significant and international manifestations in music, literature, and architecture, as well as the visual arts. It grew from a disillusionment with the rationalism of 18th century enlightenment. Despite being often viewed as the opposite of neoclassicism, there were some stylistic overlapping with both movements and many romantic artists were excited by classicism. The movement focused on intense emotions, imagination, and on the impressive power of nature, a bigger and more powerful force than the one of men with its potential for disaster. Neoclassicism is a new revival of classical antiquity. While Romanticism refers not to a specific style but to an attitude of mind that may reveal itself in any number of ways, one of the earliest expressions of Romanticism was in the English landscape garden, carefully designed to appear. Natural and standing in dramatic contrast to the formal gardens of the time, the concept of the natural English garden was adopted throughout Europe and America in the following decades. In architecture, the Romantics frequently turned to alternative sources other than the Greek and Roman examples admired by the neoclassicist. Romantic architecture often revived Gothic forms and other styles such as exotic Eastern models. The Palace of Westminster, Houses of Parliament. London is an example of Romantic architecture that is also referred to as Gothic revival. In painting, Romanticism is exemplified by the paintings of Francisco Goya in Spain, Eugene Delacroix, and Theodore Garricault in France, William Blake, Henry Fuseli, Samuel Palmer, and William Turner in England, Caspar David Friedrich, and Philip Otto Runge in Germany, Francesco Hayes in Italy, Johann Christian Clausen Dahl in Norway, and Thomas Cole in America. Examples of sculptors of the Romantic period include Antoine Louis Barry, Jean-Baptiste Carpeau, Auguste Priault, and Francois Rude. As Romanticism ran its course, some aspects of the movement evolved into symbolism. Academism is the codification of art into rules that can be learned in art academies. It promotes the classical ideals of beauty and artistic perfection. There was also a very strict hierarchy of subjects. At the top, there were paintings that depicted historic events, including the biblical and classical ones, followed by the portrait and by the landscape. At the bottom of the hierarchy were still life and genre painting. Nicolas Poulsen was the artist whose works and theories played the most significant role in the development of academism. The veils of academism were situated in the center of the Enlightenment project of discovering the basic principles and ideals of art. During the 18th century across all Europe, many academies were founded that will later dominate the art of the 19th century. In order to study at an art academy, young artists had to take an admission exam, and after being admitted, they would study there for multiple years. Most of the 19th century French art movements were exterior or even opposing the values of academism. Some of the most important artists of the French Academy were William Bouguereau, 1825-1905, John Leon Jerome, 1824-1904-1904, Alexandre Cabanel, 1823-1823, 1815-89, and Thomas Kuchar, 1815-1879.
Academic art is closely related to Beaux Arts architecture, which developed in the same place and holds to a similar classicizing ideal. The Beaux Arts style takes its name from the École des Beaux Arts in Paris, where it developed and where many of the main exponents of the style studied. When it comes to architecture and applied arts, the 19th century is best known as the century of revivals. One of the most well-known revivalist styles is the Gothic Revival or Neo-Gothic, which first appeared in the mid-18th century in a few houses in England, like the Strawberry Hill House in London. However, these houses were isolated cases since the beginning of the 19th century was dominated by neoclassicism. Later, between 1830 and 1840, a taste and nostalgia for the rediscovery of past styles, ranging from the Middle Ages to the 18th century, developed under the influence of Romanticism. Approximately until World War I, rehashes of the past dominated the world of architecture and applied arts. Associations between styles and building types appeared, for example, Egyptian for prisons, Gothic for churches, or Renaissance revival for banks and exchanges. These choices were the result of other associations. The pharaohs with death and eternity, the Middle Ages with Christianity, or the Medici family with the rise of banking and modern commerce. Sometimes these styles were also seen in a nationalistic way, on the idea that architecture might represent the glory of a nation. Some of them were seen as national styles, like the Gothic Revival in the UK, and the German states or the Romanian Revival in Romania. Augustus Pugin called the Gothic style the absolute duty of the English architect, despite the fact that the style is of French origin. This way, architecture and the applied arts were used to grant the era of a highly idealized, glorious past. Some architects and designers associated historic styles, especially the medieval ones, with an idealized fantasy organic life, which they put in comparison with the reality of their time. Despite revivalism being so prevalent, this doesn't mean that there was no originality in these works. Architects, Ebenistes and other craftsmen, especially during the second half of the 19th century, created mixes of styles by extracting and interpreting elements specific to certain eras and areas. This practice is known as eclecticism. This stylistic development occurred during a period when the competition of world's fairs motivated many countries to invent new industrial methods of creation. Realism emerged in the mid-19th century, circa 1840, and had counterparts in sculpture, literature, and drama, often referred to as naturalism in literature. In 19th century painting, the term realism refers more to the subject matter depicted than to the style or technique. Realist paintings typically represent ordinary places and people engaged in everyday activities as opposed to grand idealized landscapes, mythological gods, biblical subjects, and historical figures and events that have often dominated painting in Western culture. Courbet said, I cannot paint an angel because I have never seen one. Realism was also in part a reaction to the often dramatic, exotic, and emotionally charged work of Romanticism. The term realism is applied relative to the idealized imagery of neoclassicism and the romanticized imagery of romanticism. Artists such as Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot and Henri Daumier had loose associations with realism, as did members of the Barbizon school, particularly Jean-Francois Millet. But it was perhaps Gustave de Corbett who was the central figure in the movement, self-identifying as a realist, advocating realism, and influencing younger artists such as Edward Mannett. One significant aspect of realism was the practice of painting landscapes in plain air and its subsequent influence on Impressionism. Beyond France, realism is exemplified by artists such as Wilhelm Liebel in Germany, Ford Maddox Brown in England, and Winslow Homer in the United States. Art historian H. H. Arneson wrote, The chronological sequence of neoclassicism Romanticism and realism is, of course, only a convenient stratification of movements or tendencies so inextricably bound up with one another and with the preceding movements that it is impossible to tell where one ended and another began. And this becomes even more pertinent and complex as one follows all of the movements and isms into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Impressionism emerged in France under the influences of realism, the Barbizon school, and in plain air painters like Eugene Bodine, Camille Corot, Charles, 
Francois d'Aubigny, and Johann Barthel John Kine. Starting in the late 1850s, several of the Impressionists had made acquaintances and friendships as students in Paris, notably at the Free Academy Suisse and Charles Glare studio. Their progressive work was frequently rejected by the conservative juries of the prestigious Académie des Beaux-Arts Salons, a forum where many artists turned to establish their reputations, and many of the young artists were included in a highly publicized but much ridiculed Salon des Refuses in 1863. In 1874, they formed the Société Anonyme Cooperative des Artistes, Pintres, Sculptors, Gravures, independent of the Academy, and mounted the first of several Impressionist exhibitions in Paris through to 1886 when their eighth and final exhibition was held. Important figures in the movement included Frederick Basile, Gustave Calabata, Mary Cassatt, Paul Cézanne, Edgar Degas, Armand Guillaumin, Edouard Manet, Claude Monet, Bertha Morissot, Camille Pissarro, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Auguste Renoir, and Alfred Sisley. Although Impressionism was primarily a movement of painters, Degas and Renoir also produced sculptures and others like Auguste Rodin and Madarda Rosso are sometimes linked to Impressionism. By 1885, Impressionism had achieved some prominence, and yet a younger generation were already pushing the limits beyond Impressionism. Artists from Russia, Australia, America, and Latin America soon adopted Impressionist styles. A few of the original Impressionists continued producing significant work into the 1910s and 1920s. Although not unprecedented, many of the techniques used were in contrast to traditional methods. Paintings were often completed in hours or days with wet paint applied to wet paint, opposed to wet on dry paint, completed in weeks and months. Rather than applying glazes and mixed colors, pure colors were often applied side by side in thick, opaque, impasto strokes, blending in the eye of the viewer when observed from a distance. Black was used very sparingly, or not at all, and defining lines were placed with nuanced strokes of color forming the subjects, contours, and shapes. Art historian H. W. W. Jansen said instead of adding to the illusion of real space, it strengthens the unity of the illusion of real space, it strengthens the unity of the actual painted surface. Impressionist paintings typically depict landscapes, portraits, still lifes, domestic scenes, daily leisure and nightlife, all treated in a realist manner. Compositions were often based on unusual perspectives, appearing spontaneous and candid. The paintings were usually void of didactic, symbolic, or metaphoric meanings, and rarely addressed the biblical, mythological, and historical subjects that were so highly regarded by the academies or the darker and psychological interest explored by the symbolist. The nuances of light, shadow, atmosphere, and reflections of colors from surfaces were examined, sometimes emphasizing changes of these elements in time. The painting itself was the subject of the painting. It was art for art's sake, an idea that had been floating around for a few of decades, but it perhaps reached a new, high in consistency in Impressionism. Symbolism emerged in France and Belgium in the third quarter of the 19th century and spread throughout Europe in the 1870s, and later to America to a lesser extent. It evolved from Romanticism without a clear or defining demarcation point, although poetry, literature, and specifically the publication of Charles Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of Evil, in 1857 were significant in the development of symbolism. It had international expression in poetry, literature, drama, and music. In architecture, the applied arts and decorative arts symbolism closely paralleled and overlapped into Art Nouveau. Symbolism is often inextricably linked to other contemporary art movements surfacing and finding expression within other styles like post-impressionism, Les Nobis, the decadent movement, the Fin de Siecle, Art Nouveau, the Munich Secession, the Vienna Secession, Expressionism, and even the Pre-Raphaelites, which had formed before and influenced symbolism as well. Artists as diverse as James McNeil Whistler, Eugene Carrier, Ferdinand Hodler, Fernand Kopmoff, Giovanni Segantini, Lucien Levy Dermer, Jean Delville, and James Ensor all had varying degrees of association with symbolism. Art historian Robert L. Delavoye wrote symbolism was less a school than the atmosphere of a period. 
It quickly began to fade with the onset of fauvism, cubism, futurism, and had largely dissipated by the outbreak of the First World War. However, it did find some sustained development and relevance in the metaphysical school, which in turn had a profound influence on surrealism. The subject's themes and meanings of symbolist art are frequently veiled and obscure, but at its best still manage to resonate deeply on psychological or emotional levels. The subjects are often presented as metaphors or allegories, aiming to evoke highly subjective, personal, introspective emotions and ideas in the viewer, without clearly defining or addressing the subject directly. The poet Stephanie Malarm wrote, depict not the thing, but the effect it produces, and to name an object is to suppress three quarters of the pleasure of the poem, which is made to be understood little by little. The English painter George Frederick Watts stated, I paint ideas, not things. Post-impressionism is a rather imprecise term applied to a diverse generation of artists. In its strictest sense, it pertains to four highly influential artists. Paul Cezanne, Paul Gagwin, Georges Charest, and Vincent van Gogh. Each passed through an impressionist phase, but ultimately emerged with four very original but different styles. Collectively, their work anticipated, and often directly influenced, much of the avant-garde art that appeared before the First World War, including Fauvism, Cubism, Expressionism, and Early Abstraction. Cezanne, particularly influential on Cubism, and Van Gogh worked in relative isolation, away from Paris at critical points in their careers, while Surat and Gauguin worked in groups more collaboratively at key points in their development. Another important artist of the period is Toulouse Lautrec, an influential painter as well as graphic artist. In a broader sense, post-impressionism includes a generation of predominantly French and Belgian artists who worked in a range of styles and groups. Most had come under the sway of impressionism at some point, but pushed their work beyond it into a number of factions as early as the mid-1880s, sometimes as a logical development of impressionism, other times as a reaction against it. Post-impressionists typically depicted impressionist subjects, but the work, particularly synthetism, often contained symbolism, spiritualism, and moody atmospheres that rarely appeared in impressionism. Unnatural colors, patterns, flat planes, odd perspectives and viewpoints pushed to extremes, all moved the center of modernism a step closer to abstraction with a standard for experimentation. Neo-impressionism, divisionism, 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 or pointillism. Circa 1884, 1894, explored light and color based on scientific color theories, creating mosaics of brush strokes and pure colors, sometimes laid out in rhythmic patterns with lines influenced by Art Nouveau. The leading artists were Georges Surat and Paul Signick. Others include Henry Edmund Cross, Maximilian Luce, Albert Dubois Pillet, and for a period Pissarro and Van Gogh. It was influential on Fauvism, and elements of the style appeared in Expressionism, Cubism, and elements of the style appeared in Expressionism. Synthetism, Cloisonism circa 1888, 1903. Cloisonism was conceived by Emile Bernard and immediately taken up and developed by Paul Gouin and others, while at an artist colony in Pont Aven, Britain, France. The style resembled cloisonne enamel or stained glass, with flat, bold colors outlined in black or dark colors. Synthetism, exemplified in the work of Gauguin and Paul Serussier, is slightly a broader term with less emphasis on dark outlines and cloisonne qualities. Other artists include Cuno Amiette, Louis Anquetin, Charles Filiger, Jacob Mayer de Hayon, Charles Laval, and Armand Seguin. Their work greatly influenced Fauvism and Expressionism, Les Nabi Circa. 1890-1905, Hebrew for Prophets or Illuminati, was a larger movement in France and Belgium that eclectically drew on progressive elements in synthetism, neo-impressionism, symbolism, and art nouveau. Perhaps more influential than the art, were the numerous theories, manifestos, and infectious enthusiasm for the avant-garde, setting the tone for the proliferation of movements and isms in the first quarter of the 20th century. La Revue Blanche often published Les Nobis and Symbolist Content. The work of Edouard Voilard and Pierre Bonnard, K. 1890-1910, is exemplary of Les Nobis, though both evolved in their styles and produced significant work into the 1940s. 
Other artists include Maurice Dennis, Maxime de Thomas, Mayer de Hayan, Henry Gabriel Ebels, Georges Lacombe, Aristide Maillol, Paul Ranson, Kerry Xavier Roussel, Armand Seguin, Paul Serussier, Felix Valatin, John Vercade, and others. The history of 20th century art is a narrative of endless possibilities and the search for new standards, each being torn down in succession by the next. The art movements of Fauvism, Expressionism, Cubism, Abstract Art, Dadaism, and Surrealism led to further explorations of new creative styles and manners of expression. Increasing global interaction during this time saw an equivalent influence of other cultures into Western art such as Pablo Picasso being influenced by Iberian sculpture, African sculpture, and primitivism, Japonism, and Japanese woodcuts, which had themselves been influenced by Western Renaissance draftsmanship, had an immense influence on Impressionism and subsequent artistic developments. The influential example set by Paul Gauguin's interest in oceanic art and the sudden popularity among the cognoscenti in early 20th century Paris of newly discovered African fetish sculptures and other works from non-European cultures were taken up by Picasso, Henry Matesi, and many of their colleagues. Later in the 20th century, pop art and abstract expressionism came to prominence. Art Nouveau, French, New Art, was an international and widespread art and design movement that emerged in the final decades of the 19th century until the First World War in 1914. It was catapulted into international prominence with the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris, developing almost simultaneously in parts of Europe and the U.S. It was an attempt to create a unique and modern form of expression that evoked the spirit of the new century. It manifested in painting, illustration, sculpture, jewelry, metalwork, glass, ceramics, textiles, graphic design, furniture, architecture, costume design, and fashion. Art Nouveau artists aim to raise the status of craft and design to the level of fine art. The movement is highly associated with sinuous organic forms, such as flowers, vines, and leaves, but also insects and animals, through the works of artists like Alphonse Mucha, Victor Horta, Hector Guimard, and Tony Gaudi, René Lalique, or Emile Woody, or Emily Galloy. Art Nouveau designs and buildings can often be asymmetrical. Although there are identifying characteristics, the style also displayed many regional and national interpretations. Despite being a short-lived fashion, it paved the way for the modern architecture and design of the 20th century. It was the first architectural style without historic precedent, the 19th century being notorious for a practice known as historicism, which is the use of visual styles that consciously echo the style of a previous artistic era. Between circa 1870 and 1900, a crisis of historicism occurred, during which the historicist culture was critiqued, one of the voices being Friedrich Nietzsche in 1874, who diagnosed a malignant historical fervors as one of the crippling symptoms of a modern culture burdened by archaeological study and faith in the laws of historical progression. Despite this, Art Nouveau was also heavily influenced by styles from the past such as Celtic, Gothic, and Rococo art, and also by the arts and crafts movement, aestheticism, symbolism, and especially by Japanese art. Fauvism emerged from post-impressionism, gradually developing into the first major movement of the 20th century. Its genesis was in 1895 when Henry Matisse, the oldest and central figure, entered the studio of Gustave Moreau at the École des Beaux Arts. There he met Georges Roel, Charles Camoin, Henry Manguin, and Albert Marquet. Marquet said as early as 1898 Matisse and I were working in what was later to be called the Fauve Manor. The first exhibitions at the Independence in which we were, I believe, the only ones to paint in pure tones go back to 1901. By 1902-3, the circle of like-minded artists had grown to include Georges Brock, André Durain, Raoul Dufy, Othon Fries, Jean Metzinger, Jean Puy, Louis Valtat, Keyes Van Dungen, and Maurice de Vlaminck. During this period, a number of influential retrospective exhibitions were held in Paris. Surat 1900-1905, Van Gogh 5, Van Gogh 1901-1905, Toulouse-Lautrec 1902, Gauguin 1906, 
Zan 1902, Guaguay 1906, Zan 1907, all relatively unknown to the public at that time. Matisse and Durain collected African carvings, a novel but growing curiosity of the time. Matisse spent the summer of 1904 in St. Tropez painting with the neo-impressionist Paul Signick and Henry Edmund Cross, followed in 1905 by Camoin Manguin Cross, followed in 1905 by Camoin Manguin and Marquet. The artist exhibited regularity at the Salon des Independents and the Salon d'Automie 1903, 1908, and in 1905, their work created a sensation and a scandal. Matisse stated, we were exhibiting at the Salon d'Automie, Durain, Manguin, Marquet, Puy, and a few others were hung together in one of the larger galleries. In the center of this room, the sculptor Marquet exhibited a bust of a child very much in the Italian style. Vauvexel's art critic for Gill. Blass entered the room and said, Well, well, Donatello in the mist of wild beasts, Donatello ches les faves. The movement had not been perceived as an entity by the public, but once published, the name stuck. Unlike the Impressionist and their long struggle for acceptance, the avant garde had an eager audience by 1906. 1906, 1907, and the Favist were attracting collectors from America to Russia. However, Favism largely dissolved in 1908, as Cubism appeared, most of the artists began exploring other styles and moving in different directions. Only Matisse and Dufy continued to explore Favism into the 1950s. The Fauvist painted landscapes in plein air, interiors, figures, and still lifes, following examples of realism, impressionism, and post-impressionism. They applied paint with loose brush strokes in thick, unnatural, often contrasting vibrant colors at times straight from the tube. Gauguin's influence, with his exploration of the expressive values and spatial aspects of patterning with flat, pure colors, as well as his interest in primitivism were significant, as was Neo-Impressionism. Matisse explained, For a long time color served as a complement of design. The painters of the Renaissance constructed the picture by line, adding local color afterwards, writing from Delacroix to Van Gogh and chiefly to Gagan, by way of the Impressionist who cleared the ground, and way of the Impressionist who cleared the ground. Suzanne, who gave the final impulse and introduced colored volumes, we can follow this rehabilitation of color's function, this restoration of its emotive power. Fauvism was the culmination in a shift, from drawing and line as the fundamental foundations of design and painting to color, and they depicted their subjects on the verge of abstraction. Expressionism was an international movement in painting, sculpture, the graphic arts, poetry, literature, theater, film, and architecture. Some associate the second Viennese school and other music of the period with the movement. Most historians place the beginning of Expressionism in 1905 with the founding of the Die Brucke. However, several artists were producing influential work that was in the spirit of Expressionism circa 1885, 1905, including Lavis Corinth, James Ensor, Kathy Kolwitz, Paula Mottersson Becker, Edvard Munch, Emil Nolde, and Christian Rolfs, among others. Many of these artists later exhibited and associated with various expressionist groups. Expressionist painting is characterized by loose, spontaneous, frequently thick, impasto brushwork. It often conveyed how the artist felt about their subject, opposed to what it looked like, putting intuition and gut feelings over realistic representations or art theories. Expressionism was frequently infused with an angst or joy and an overall engagement with contemporary life and social issues that was often absent from Fauvism's focus on design and color applied to neutral subjects. Woodcut prints are particularly noteworthy in Expressionism. Expressionism can sometimes overlap and integrate with other styles and movements, such as symbolism, fauvism, futurism, futurism, abstraction, and da-da. Several groups and factions of expressionists appeared at various times and places. Die Brucke, The Bridge, 1905, 1905, 1913, aspired to connect all revolutionary and surging elements. It was founded by four architectural students, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Erich Heckel, Karl Schmidt Rotluff, and Fritz Blail. Sharing a studio in Dresden, they produced paintings, carvings, prints, and organized exhibitions, separating in the summer to work independently. 
Their first exhibit was in 1905, later joined by Emil Nolde and Max Pechstein in 1906, and Otto Mueller in 1910, among others. Influences included Gothic art, primitivism, Art Nouveau, and developments in Paris, particularly Van Gogh and Fauvism. The group shifted to Berlin in 1911 and later dissolved in 1913. Der Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider, 1911-1914, founded by Wassily Kandinsky and Franz Marc, was a relatively informal group that organized exhibitions of art from Paris and Europe, as well their own. It was one in a series of increasingly progressive groups splitting from the Art Academy in Munich, including the Munich Secession in 1892, Realist and Impressionist, Phalanx in 1901, Post-Impressionist, Neue Künstlervereinigung, Post-Impressionist, Neue Künstlervereinigung, and, and the Blue Rider in 1911. Artists associated with the latter two groups included the Berliuk brothers, Heinrich Kampendonk, Alexej von Jolensky, Paul Klee, August Mackey, Gabriel Munter, and Marianne von Warfkin. The euphonious almanac Der Blav Reiter, a collection of influential essays, and Kandinsky's concerning the spiritual in art with his ideas on non-objective art were both published in 1912. The Blue Rider ended with the outbreak of World War I in which Mack and Mark both died. Other artists such as Oskar Kokoschka, Egon Schiel, and Richard Gersel emerged in Austria. French artists Georges Rouault and Shame Soutine had affinities with the movement. Sculptors include Ernst Barlock, Wilhelm Leum Bruck, Gerhard Marx, and William Wauer. Architects associated with Expressionism include Max Bird, Hermann Finsterlin, Johann Friedrich Hager, Michel de Klerk, Erich Mendelssohn, Hans Spolzig, Hans Scherun, Rudolf Steiner, and Bruno Tott. Der Sturm, The Storm 1910-1932, was a magazine with much Expressionist content founded by Herworth Walden, with an associated gallery in Berlin opened in 1912 and a theater company and school in opened 1918. Films regarded as expressionistic, some considered as classics, include The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Robert Wyan, 1920, Nosferatu, W. Murnau, 1922, and Metropolis, Fritz Lang, 1927. After World War I, a tendency to withdraw from the avant-garde by many artists occurred. Seen in the work of the original Fauvists during the 1920s, Picasso and Stravinsky's neoclassical periods, and de Chirico's late work, this tendency was called New Objectivity, K1919-1933, in Germany, and in contrast to the nostalgic nature of this work elsewhere, it was characterized by disillusionment and ruthless social criticisms. New objectivity artists mostly emerged from Expressionist and Dada Malias, including Otto Dix, Christian Schad, Rudolf Schlifter, George Schulz, and Jean Maman. Max Beckman and George Gross also had some association with new objectivity for a period. Although not intrinsically expressionistic, the Stadtliches Bauhaus School of Building, 1919-1933, was an influential German school merging crafts, decorative, and fine arts. Moving from Weimar to Desso to Berlin, it changed and evolved in focus with time. Directors included architects Walter Gropius, 1919-1928, Hannes Mayer, 1928-1930, and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, 1930-1933. At various points, the faculty included Joseph Albers, Theo van Doesburg, Lionel Feininger, Johannes Itten, Paul Klee, Wassily Kandinsky, El Lissitzky, Gerhard Marx, Laszlo Moholy Nagy, Oscar Schlemmer. Bauhaus architects greatly influenced the international style, which was characterized by simplified forms, a lack of ornamentation, a union of design and function, and the idea that mass production could be compatible with personal artistic vision. As the Nazi party rose to power, modern art was dubbed degenerate art, and the Bauhaus was closed in 1933, subduing modernism in Germany for several years. Cubism consisted in the rejection of perspective, which leads to a new organization of space where viewpoints multiply, producing a fragmentation of the object that renders the predilection for form over the content of the representation obvious. Pablo Picasso, Georges Brock, and other Cubist artists were inspired by the sculptures of Iberia, Africa, and Oceania exhibited in the Louvre and the Ethnographic Museum in the Trocadero. 
and which were being offered at flea markets and in sale rooms. Uh, Picasso studies an object the way a surgeon dissects a corpse, wrote the critic and poet Guillaume Apollinaire in 1913. Five years earlier, Pablo Picasso and Georges Brock, friends, colleagues, and rivals, had begun to reject perspectival realism for a form of artistic autopsy, an utterly revolutionary painting style that looked inside and around objects, presenting them analytically, objectively, and completely, impersonally. Art Deco appeared in France as a style of luxury and modernity. Soon, it spread quickly throughout the world, most dramatically in America, becoming more streamlined though the 1930s. The style was named after the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts, held in Paris in 1925. Its exuberance and fantasy captured the spirit of the Roaring Twenties and provided an escape from the realities of the Great Depression during the 1930s. It had ancient Greek, Roman, African, Aztec, and Japanese influences, but also futurist, cubist, and Bauhaus ones. It sometimes blended with the Egyptian revival style due to the discovery in 1922 of the tomb of Tutankhamun and the Egypt ammonia that it caused. Two examples of this are Le Luxor Cinema in Paris 1919-1920, one by Henry Zipsy and the Egyptian Theater in DeKalb, Illinois, U.S. 1929-1930, by Elmer F. B. Hearns in decorative arts, including architecture, low-relief designs, and angular patterns and shapes were used. Predominant materials include chrome, brass, polished steel and aluminum, inlaid wood, stone, and stained glass. Some of the most important Art Deco artists are the Paris-based Polish painter Tamara de Lempica, the Ukrainian-born French poster artist Adolphe Jean-Marie Moron, known as Cassandra, and the French furniture designer and the French furniture designer and interior decorator Emile Jacques Rader, Emile Jacques Ruhlman. Surrealism emerged as a faction of data, formally announcing its inception in 1924 with André Breton's Manifesto of Surrealism. Originally a literary group of poets and writers in Paris, it soon developed into an international movement that included painters, sculptors, photographers, and filmmakers. A second Manifesto du Surrealisme was published in 1929. Surrealism did not have significant expression in applied or decorative arts, architecture, or music, although a few isolated examples could be identified at G. Chess Sets, Furniture, and Las Posa, the small and short-lived metaphysical school circa 1910-1921, with Giorgio de Chirico as its principal figure, was highly influential on Surrealism. The Surrealist explored a myriad of innovative techniques. Some had recently been developed in cubism and data. Others were new, including collage, found objects assemblage, random chance, rayographs, photograms, painting on sand, dripping and flinging paint, decalcomania, frottage, fumage, and raclage. Two fundamental approaches predominate Surrealist art. Automatism dominated in the early years, which can be seen in the work of artists like Andre Masson and Joan Miro. Other artists, swayed by work of Giorgio de Chirico, used more traditional methods and mediums to illustrate unfiltered thoughts and incongruous juxtapositions, including Salvador Dali and René Magritte. Significant artists include Jean Arp, Hans Belmer, Victor Bronner, Louis Bunuel, Joseph Cornell, Oscar Dominguez, Max Ernst, Wifredo Lam, Yves Tanguay, Man Ray, Alberto Giacomti, Mirate, Alberto Giacomti, Mirat Oppenheim, and Roberto Mata. Other important artists informally accosted with surrealism include Marcel Duchamp, Pablo Picasso, and Frida Kahlo. Surrealist ideas and theories were discussed in a successive series of journals La Revolution Surrealiste, 1924 1929. Le Surrealisme au service de la Révolution, 1930-1930-1933, The automatic paintings produced by André Masson and Joan Miro, as well as latecomers to Surrealism like Roberto Mata and Arshail Gorky, had a considerable influence on the Abstract Expressionist and the Abstract Expressionist in the late 1940s, with a measure of data's irreverence and contempt for the traditional political, religious, and bourgeois values of Western culture that they believed had led the world into the First World War. 
Breton and other founding members were veterans. The Surrealist explored the possibilities that had been opened up by Sigmund Freud regarding the subconscious mind, pure psychic automatism by which one intends to express verbally, in writing or by any other method, the real functioning of the mind. Dictation by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason and beyond any aesthetic or moral preoccupation. Surrealism sought to express pure thought, unfiltered and uncensored by political, religious, moral or rational principles. As Europe struggled to recover from World War II, America moved into a position of political, economic and cultural strength. During the 1940s and 1950s, abstract expressionism emerged as the first specifically American art movement to have an international impact. In consequence, the art world's focus shifted from Europe to New York. Abstract expressionists were a small group of loosely associated artists who had similar outlooks, but different approaches. They were influenced by surrealism and believed in spontaneity, freedom of expression and abandonment of the themes of American life that had characterized national art of recent decades. One of the most famous representative of this movement was Jackson Pollock, known for his painting made by pouring, flicking, and dripping paint onto huge canvases on the ground. Other artists include Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein, Robert Motherwell, Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko, and Clifford Still. After World War II, consumerism and the mass media surged, and as a result, pop art developed in both London and New York. In a London exhibition in 1956, the word Pope was used in a collage created by Richard Hamilton, 1922-2011, made of American magazines. Pop art was a reaction against abstract expressionism and interpreted ideas of pop culture. In celebrating and commenting on consumerism, pop artists as they became known, produced colorful images based on advertising, the media, and shopping, featuring film stars, comic strips, flags, packaging, and food. Things that everyone, rather than just a highbrow few, could relate to. The term minimalism was not new, but it gained momentum in the 1960s, specifically describing a style of art characterized by detached restraint. Originating in New York, it was a reaction against abstract expressionism, but it also embraced constructivist ideas that art should be made of modern materials. Thus, minimalist artists, primarily sculptors, often used non-traditional materials and production methods, often employing industrial or specialist fabricators to produce works to their specifications. The term was chiefly used to describe a group of American sculptors who evaluated the space around them, aiming to challenge assumptions and present familiar objects in new ways. Their artworks don't have any symbolism or hidden meaning as they try to enable viewers to reevaluate art and space around forms. Unlike a figural sculpture on which the viewer focuses to the exclusion of the room in which it stands, minimalist art becomes one with its space. By focusing on the effects of context and the theatricality of the viewing experience, Minimalism exerted an indirect but powerful influence on later developments in conceptual and performance art, as well as providing a foil for the rise of postmodernism. Despite developing almost 50 years after Marcel Duchamp's ideas, conceptual art showed that art does not always have to be judged aesthetically. It was never a single cohesive movement, but an umbrella term that now covers several types of art and emerged more or less concurrently in America and Europe first defined in New York, first defined in New York. Conceptual artists promote the art of ideas or concepts, suggesting that they can be more valid in the modern world than technical skill or aesthetics. No matter the art media of an artwork, it is considered as no more than a vehicle for presenting the concept. At its most extreme, conceptual art foregoes the physical object completely, using verbal or written message to convey the idea.